All right. Welcome, 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 Mecca family. Thank you all so much for tuning in to Book Mecca Presents. Today we have a fabulous, fabulous author that I have definitely enjoyed reading her book. It is a young adult novel titled I Am Not Dying With You Tonight. Be sure to check it out, grab it, read it with your kids, read it by yourself. You definitely want to watch and read this. So we're going to talk a little bit intimately with Kimberly about her inspiration, about all the things about the story itself. Um, but if you don't know who Bookmaker is, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, share and tell your friends. We are an online Black bookstore and platform for Black authors in all things literature. So trying to not only emphasize the importance of reading, but amplify the voices of the writers behind the work. So one of those writers we have I want to introduce is Miss Kimberly Latrice Jones. She has a resume, let me tell you. She definitely does. She's a novelist, a director, a human rights activist, a thespian, a graduate of Chicago Academy of the Arts. And that's just a little bit of her bio. Some of you may have seen her uh, monologue. It went viral here recently and she's been interviewed by all major networks, uh, Trevor Noah. I, I, I think I've seen her video so many times and it's been shared a lot, but it's a, a monologue on how can we win and it definitely fits the times that we're in. If you haven't taken a look at it, do so. You can also check out the link on our page there if you need to get to it. So without further ado, I just wanna welcome you, Kimberly. Thank you so much for talking with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Oh, great, great. Well, let's dive right in. <laughs> so good. first thing I, I'm sure you get asked this a million times is, how did you get started? You know, it's funny because it all started as a child. Um, I was just like, I, first of all, let me start by saying I went undiagnosed ADHD all through school. And so I didn't get a diagnosis until I was in like my, I ain't gonna tell how old I am now, but I was in my like mid thirties um, when I finally got diagnosed. And so it was like a light bulb when I was like, all this stuff started to make sense because I had so many teachers who were like, would say to my mom, she's so bright you know, she can consume the information. She's just not doing the work. I, like I got chalked up to just being lazy, like a kid who was like smart, but didn't apply themselves when actually like I was struggling because I didn't have the necessary tools to combat the disability that I was unaware that I had. Mm -hmm. So like most kids who have those kind of issues in schools, I did what all kids like that did. I became class clown. <laughs> so yeah, I was like super class clown. And I, and I, um, I became a masterful storyteller in order to distract from the fact that I was struggling with school. And so it just started with that. Like I just always, I just started with that. I always had a love of books, a love of reading. And then about 10 years ago, um, I took a break. I was working in the film and television industry and I had a very you know, young child at home at the time. And I just didn't want to work 12 hour days on movies and TV shows anymore. Not while my child was small, um, cause he would be asleep when I left to go to work and he would be asleep when I got home. And I just didn't like that. And so I took a part-time job at a little children's bookstore called Little Shop of Stories in Decatur, right. Georgia. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just thinking, oh, I'm just gonna get like this little part-time job and I can bring my son for story time. And his dad was fine with it. And was like, yeah, that's, if that's what you want to do. That's cool. And, um, it ended up that that little part time job turned into a whole nother career um, because I fell in love all over again with kid lit um, and began to make many, many relationships and eventually worked my way up to being the general manager for the store. And once I got into that position, then, of course, you know, and you know this, then I started going to like book con and ABA and Winter Institute and Children's Institute and all these spaces where I was making real relationships with publishers and publicists. And things like that and then i started a um a talk show um with a dear friend of mine vanya stoyanova who's a legendary uh, liter uh literary photographer and we started like a jimmy um fallon-esque talk show called yatl where we interviewed y'all can watch that on youtube um where you where we interviewed young adult authors is that still going so, on 
uh, yeah, it's still going on. I am my schedule is too crazy, so I don't co. I only co-host like periodically now. So Vanya is the primary host now, yeah. uh, but we're st- we still do stuff in tandem. Um, but yeah, so we did this like this crazy literary talk show called YATL, and all of that put me in a position um, where going to look for and seek out and get a publishing deal became a lot easier because I had all these relations. Mm-hmm. Well, that is a it definitely fully encompasses how you got to be yeah. where you are for sure. Yeah. yeah. I know the literary world is, I am learning so much myself. This is my baby. So <laughs> I'm learning so much about the literary world itself. It's a whole lot to yeah. learn. Yeah. It's not just about reading the books and knowing who's writing the books. It's, it's a whole behind the scenes things. And you yeah. have your hands in so many different things. I know a little bit of your bio said that you, consider yourself a lyricist (laughs) I used to when I was young oh now I'm old (laughs) now you have no bars (laughs) oh I have bars like it's it's funny because I was on David Banner's podcast a couple weeks ago and he well a week ago or so and he made me freestyle on his show but I was like um Hmm. lyricist I used to be I won't make you do that this time I won't make you do that (laughs) But I, when I was reading that, you know, the crazy thing is I see a lot of authors who kind of have that mind frame behind music and writing and it kind of goes hand in hand. Do yeah. you ever listen to music and read at the same time or write? What are you listening to? Well, I listen to music constantly and I'm constantly making playlists. Um, and it's funny because as a as an activist, I have like a Freedom Fighter playlist that I play in the car when I'm on my way to a protest or something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I listen to music constantly. It's funny because music influences me to write, but I can't write with music. So I'll be listening to music and then I'll be, I'll feel motivated and passionate to sit down and write something, but I can't listen to music while I write. And I know a lot of people have like a soundtrack while they write, but I can't do that. I need like complete silence like when I now when I open up my if I, right now when I open up my laptop like anybody in my house will be like they'll they'll scutter, scutter they'll, they'll scatter like roaches because they're just like oh man she's getting ready to write and I and I do I have to write in like complete silence wow. so weird. so what's your motivation song you know what it's so crazy because anything Beyonce really yeah, I was like, I, I listen to Beyonce and I get amped up and I'm hey. like, hey, I'm ready to, I'm like, I'm ready to go now. But, um, you know, I, Beyonce is a person who knows, me. I like, I like a lot of the young kids. Like I like her. I really dig her. Um, and, um, you know, one of my, one of my um, business partners, uh, T-Dog the Don, I listen to his music a lot and shout out T-Dog. <laughs> shout out T-Dog. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just listen. I listen to a lot of different things, but I, but I, but I, I really love the blues too because I grew up in Chicago, so I love the blues. So I can, I a lot of times if I'm writing something a little bit darker, then I definitely I listen to me some Muddy Waters and some Howling Wolf to get it going. Yeah, blues, blues. I hear yeah. you. Yeah, and blues is that is like a story in itself. Listening to some, so I can definitely relate to that. I can see how that fits. Yes. Uh, Going back to your story of I'm Not Down With You Tonight, mm-hmm. this is a co-authored book. Yes. So tell us a little bit how that came to be with you working with someone to write a book. So it was my co-author, Geely, This that concept was her idea. Hmm. So um, we worked on like pulling it together, but the, the original concept was her idea. So she had seen during the civil unrest in Baltimore after the, the death of Freddie Gray, she has seen an article in the newspaper um, about a group of kids who have been trapped behind a police barricade. Um, mm-hmm. What had happened was the kids, um, they, had, they knew the protests were coming. And so they closed down school early and then, but then they shut down public transportation. Well, a lot of kids take public transportation to get home. So they got trapped. They didn't have anywhere to get home. So there was a group of kids who got trapped behind a police barricade who weren't participating um, in the civil unrest, they were just stuck out there. And the news kind of like moved away from that story. They never circle back to it because they don't, because you know, they want to focus on the things that they can sensationalize. Um, and so Gilly and I couldn't, you know, 
she came to me with this story. Like I saw this story about this group of kids who got trapped behind a police barricade. And she's like, and I haven't been able to find them and figure out what's going on with them. And she's a lawyer by trade. So she had all of her bullet points. I was still working at the bookstore then at Little Shop of Stories. And she came into the bookstore while I was on shift and she had all of her bullet points as to how she was going to convince me to write this book. And I think that she felt just like as a white woman, she did not have the informed lived experience to tell this story, but she really felt compelled to tell this story. And so she was just like, if I could just get Kim to co-write it with me, um, I think I'll be in a better space. Yeah. And so she had all this stuff about how she was going to convince me to write it. And she got through like two of her bullet points. And I was just like, yeah, you had me at like right together. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So, so we always jokingly say that was our Jerry Maguire moment. Okay. Um, but uh it's funny because we told that story at a uh, college and, and it was like crickets and then we realized that even college age students jerry Maguire came out before they were born and we were oh, like man that just made me feel really old right there. yeah yeah i was like well i'm officially old <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because we, we were like and, and i was like and you had me at hello and they were like what oh yeah <laughs> and we're like jerry Maguire, and they're like Nothing. what is that a tv show we're like oh we're old um yes. it's official it's official. <laughs> it's well, official well that story is definitely ripped from the headlines then the way yeah. that you wrote it and yeah. i love how it's taken from two different perspectives one from a young teenager or young black teenager young white teenager and they're not friends no but they are stuck in this scenario of trying to get home safely and all this craziness happens around them yeah. So I came across, which I, I love makeup and all these kinds of things. I came across this cute little quote thing, Julep. They send these little boxes. I love Julep, yes. Yes. Well, their CEO sends cute little notes in there. Uh -huh. And one of them was, uh, she said, pretty is precious. It's dainty and polite. Pretty follows the rules. Never speaks out of turn. And it always asks for permission first. And it kind of goes on and on like that. And then I got to thinking that your two main characters in my head were pretty girls. They were gorgeous young ladies. Yeah. And they could have went about their own lives and just went with the flow, tried to just wait things out. Mm -hmm. But they kind of had this self-realized power that they had to figure things out. They yeah. had to, and I don't see that a lot in adult novels. I see super... Uh, in young adult novels, I see a lot of superpowers. I see someone that comes to save the day, but yeah. not to where they have to look internally at themselves and find a way to make it through. Yeah. So what would you want to tell young girls and, and young people that are reading this book? What do you want them to get from it? Well, first of all, let me just say, I am like, I am over here tearing up because you are the first person I've been interviewed by that I've found that got that point. For you. Um, yeah, because that point is like critical and essential. And so Geely and I often say this book is less about race and more about perspective, but also that it's the story of two girls, right? So even though they have these completely different backgrounds and upbringings, um, which makes them see things differently throughout the course of the night, the thing that unifies them is being female and that omnipresent threat to the feminine form. And as you stated, this, this notion that um, you know, the prince on the white horse is not coming, that yeah. if you're going to survive, you have to survive your own. And the other thing we always say is that had either of these characters been male or um, male presenting, um, it would have went completely different because I honestly don't think that a male would have felt the imminent threat that these two young women felt yeah. um, in the night. And so they had to decide that they were going to take care of themselves um, and do, you know, and do absolutely what was, what was best in order to decide, you know, for them to survive the night, because otherwise they wouldn't make it. And so that's kind of what Geely and I were trying to get young girls to see is that you actually have more power within yes. than you realize that you actually have more skills accessible to you internally um, than you realize. And that it's up to you to take control of your power and decide. Because we knew from the very beginning, we wanted these girls to save themselves. Mm -hmm. That we didn't want a hero to show up and save them. And even the men that they thought would show up and be heroes for them proved to not be. And they still continuously had to yeah. rely upon themselves and rely upon their own you know, wits in order to survive the night. And so, 
particularly for Lena, the Black character that I predominantly wrote, I grew up on the South side of Chicago. Um, I was blessed that I was a person, a kid who was given lots and lots of resources mm -hmm. um, and access, which changed and, and informed who I became as a person. But there are lots of people in my neighborhood who didn't get that. And so, but I still think about how tenacious some of the girls that I've grown up with are extremely successful and they didn't have half of the resource that I had. And what I, what I wanted to showcase was this highlight of, you know, we write these one dimensional stories of hood girls and then say, that's a narrative we don't want to hear about anymore. I don't want to hear no more ghetto girl stories. I don't want to hear no more hood girl stories, but that's because we haven't seen well-developed three dimensional nuance versions of the hood girl who for the record, we all borrow from, like we all borrow from the hood girl. Mm -hmm. Every day, black, you know, hood girls are the architects of cool. They teach us all how to live, how to be, what's happening, what's the latest fashion trends, what's the latest lingo is, all of that. And that's true across the board of, of black women, period. Even even if you go into bourgeois black women, right? Like yeah, we, that little hood. Right, and right. And we and we teach the world what's hip. You yeah. know what I'm saying? We, we teach the world what's cool. And so I wanted to showcase a three-dimensional hood chick who her informed experience is the reason they can survive. Yeah. That tough skin, that rough living, that what you may look at as an attitude, which is actually gonna be a survival skill in their situation. I love the story and I loved how these young girls, it, it really made me think about my own kids. I have two girls that are 14 and 15 and just thinking, what would they do if they were in this scenario? Have I prepared them enough to where if something does happen, are they strong enough to feel like they can take things on themselves? Or would they crumble? Right. And it kind of made me also realize too that it's so much more than just that one night, that one scenario that they're in. Yeah. So when you're looking at um, other stories that you're writing, are you always thinking of the bigger picture, the big moral compass that you want to get across to the audience? Yeah, and it's, it's, and it's funny because you know, I grew up, I grew up in a, in an era where we became desensitized to violence, um, became desensitized to misogyny. Um, and so I think about the things that even me as a person, right, that I'm just like naturally drawn to that I can't even help myself. Like I cannot stop myself from listening to like the Migos or, you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, even I find myself drawn to things that may have, you know, misogynistic lyrics or may, you know, at some point per perpetrate violence in the community. And so um, when I think about how easy it is, even for me, someone who is consciously trying to do the right thing to fall into just, oh, well, I'm just listening for the beat and not concern myself with the lyrics or how those lyrics are affecting kids who don't have guidance, what they're listening to. I'm like, okay, if I know that as strong as I am, I could be a victim to this. I know that like a 13 year old girl somewhere can be a victim to this just, just as I was. Like I listened to all, you know, this misogynistic music growing up and was just like, that's my jam. It's a bop. I'm riding to the beat, okay. it's not, you know, right? You know, I'm like, it ain't hurting nobody, you know, it's my jam. And so now, because I predominantly write for children, I realize the importance of that and the importance of my narrative. But I also, I'm going to be honest, I'm a person who walks a fine line of like giving them the wealth and healthy messaging that they need, but packaging it in a way that's still cool to them yeah. that you know I don't ever want to be preachy I don't ever want to turn them off and so that's why I made these kids real kids because I was like you know we can Gila and I decided you know we can get this message across and still make them real kids like yeah. people were like it's you know you you it's a book for teenagers but there's cursing in it and I'm like well kids curse I'm telling you this is a book that you can read as an adult a kid can read you can read it together I think I've read more young adult novels this year than any year before. It has been yeah. some really good stuff coming out. What yeah. kind of reactions are you getting from the young people? Because I've seen your, you go into the schools and you do different presentations. I think you were at mm -hmm. a, a young adult literature uh, festival not too long ago. Yes, right before COVID. Woo. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a whole nother <laughs> scenario there. So what kind of reactions are you getting from the young people? 
young people love it, right? Because it's written in their language. You know, it's, it's written in AAVE. You know, the girls are popping. They're using modern lingo. They swear they got boyfriends. They, they, they're living the life that teenagers are yeah. living. In, so it feels realistic to them, but there's definitely quite a few messages embedded throughout it. But it, you know, and so because of that, young people are drawn to it. They like it. I, I know I was in um, a school in Baltimore and one of the teachers was telling me, she's like, you know, I can't get my kids to read anything, but they read this. But Gilly and I also, you know, the average young adult novel is around 60,000 words, mm-hmm. our 40,000 words. It's paced very quickly. It's paced like a movie. So yeah. it's very good for the reluctant reader. And so the kid who, you know, needs something that's a little more, more fast paced with, with less pages to get through and that kind of thing. So it's designed perfectly that for definitely for the reluctant reader, but also for the kid who loves to read, who just wants something like quick to get through and, you know, kind of action me or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I've been getting great responses from the kids. It's funny because when the book initially came out, adults didn't like it. We got, we got a really, really? yeah, our first review, our first trade review was like really like really just like it was there was no question that they disliked this book Ooh. and so then we um we started we started touring and we started going to schools and we realized that you know we may not have an adult audience and that's okay because that's not who we wrote it for but the kids loved it like we would go to high schools and they would be finishing and at the, you know, the amount of times I had a teacher say to me this group of kids I can't get them to finish a book but they finished your book wow Wow, that is something there. That speaks yeah. volumes all by itself. But I know some, I noticed you mentioned how it was easy to read. It is a very visual book. So when you're reading the story, you feel and you can see everything that's happened along with it. And I know for my youngest daughter who's reading it now, um, she has dyslexia. So she's always a little hesitant about reading, but she's been reading this really well. I love the way that it's written very plainly, very clear. So yeah. it paints a picture really well. So yeah, hats off to you for Thank that, you. for sure. And your co-author, hats off Thank to you. <laughs> we appreciate that, for sure, for sure. Now, for your inspirations for writing, because I know I want to be mindful of our time here, so I don't want to be too much of your time, but everybody has an inspiration for writing, your favorite authors. Who were some of yours? You know, I'm a bit, I was a huge fan of, of B.B. Moore Campbell, um, a big, a big fan of Claude Brown, Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston, um, of course Baldwin. You can't be a black writer and not love Baldwin. Um, love Baldwin. <laughs> no, daddy, you gotta love Baldwin. Love Baldwin. Um, yeah, modern day, I'm a huge fan of Jason Reynolds, Nick Stone, mm-hmm. Angie Thomas. Uh, Tiffany Jackson, my co-author Geely Siegel, she has a solo book coming out that I'm like, I can't wait to big up my sister's book and praise it and get people to be get excited about it. Um, my Maida Cuevas, who's a Latinx writer, um, mm-hmm. sister, um, um, she has an amazing book called Salty Bittersweet. Um, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of Maida. Um, uh, E.E. Trujillo, who wrote Fat Angie. I'm a huge fan of E.E. Like I love all these gems, drop them all. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Fat Angie is one of my favorite books. And um, yeah, this, oh, and uh, Karen Abbott. Karen Abbott is one of my favorite writers of all time. And I oddly, I mostly read YA, um, mm. but Karen Abbott is one of the few adult readers who I like, I really dig into. I call her book, um, historical sizzlers um because she writes these amazing stories about women of the of the underbelly of society so like a women in the 19 real women in the 1920s and 30s who were you know bootleggers or uh <laughs> you know yeah. Yeah, women like women went not not nasty women if you <laughs> um, <laughs> but she she writes these amazing um, even though they're nonfiction historical accounts of these women's lives, she writes in a very narrative way that really mm. paints the picture. Um, yeah, so I love, Karen Abbott is one of my favorite writers of all time. Okay, I, I see my TBR pile is just adding on up. <laughs> <laughs> I swear I have so many books that I am just going to read. It's, I'm going to yeah. get there, I'm going to get this. <laughs> so what are you reading right now? Um, right now, look, I got it. I got it right there. On you. Right. I got it. I got my computer propped up on it, but I want to pull it out because I want people to. Uh, so y'all bear with me for a second while I pull it out from up underneath, because uh, I really want people to support this book because it's absolutely uh, amazing. Right now I'm reading um, 
This is America. Oh, ooh, yeah. Have you seen this one? I've heard good things about it. I haven't read it yet. Yes. So this is America um, by Kim Johnson. Um, if y'all follow her on Instagram, is I think it's Casey Johnson writes. Um, but yes, this is uh, yeah, Casey Johnson writes is her is her, is her Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. But yeah, uh, this is all about a, a girl who has a revelation about her father who's in prison. Ooh. And it is freaking brilliant. I'm about ha- I'm about I'm about, I'm about three quarters away through it, and I'm just like, this is her debut, and I just feel like this sister has a huge career ahead of her. Wow. Well, yeah. we will definitely be checking that out. Yeah. And all of you who are watching, write down all these little tips, all <laughs> these little TBRs to add to your pile. I'm pretty sure the more the merrier. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much. Now when talk about reading a little bit, um, everybody has these little nooks and corners and things. And uh, there's a big push they had recently of women who love to decorate outdoors and indoors and interior decorate, especially during COVID. And then I saw one on reading nooks. Mm -hmm. What does your reading nook look like? So the, this is my, I'm going to show you guys my reading nook. It, It is just that big cushy chair. Chose it. And, and it's not over there right now, but I have a big table knit um, throw. So I like curl up in that chair with my throw and I'm in heaven. Love it. Love it. For heaven. I think I've liked so many things on Pinterest on my future reading of what I want it to look uh-huh. like in my head. Yeah, so until then, <laughs> in my little corner. I like the corner. I like your corner. It's got a lot of Thank you. <laughs> little baby art, little all my stuff. Keep it all um, together. The one with the purple book, that is like, that piece is so dope. That's my book, Mecca. I book. love it. My youngest did it. Lolo is art designs. I know she'd be happy I shouted her out. Yes. Love <laughs> <laughs> That's all her painting right. for sure. Uh, there is one thing that someone wanted me to ask you. They've seen your viral video. Mm-hmm. They know you're an activist. Which came first, the activism or the writing? Or was it kind of all together? I think it was kind of all together, right? Because I've been on, I've been, you know, an activist in some way, shape, form, or fashion since I was about eight years old, Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm forty, and I'm forty-four now. So um, it it all started um, when I was eight years old, and I went by the version of viral we had at that time, which was the national news, and I cussed out President Reagan. So that was, I was about eight years old when that happened at eight. And at eight. Yes. I gave him a piece of my mind. And so I've been cooking out of America a long time. Um, <laughs> but um, people were calling my mother from Mississippi, from all over being like, did you see your baby on the news telling the president about himself? And so my mother was smart enough to nurture that. And so she put me in an after school program at Operation Push Rainbow Coalition. <laughs> I also went to after school programs. Um, as I got older at the DuSable Museum, which is the African-American Museum. I grew up in Chicago, in Chicago. And then I went on um, for high school. I went to after school programs at the ETA, which is the Ebony Theater Association, where I took classes in you know, dance, music, art, and theater. But I also learned the history of Black dance, music, art, and theater. Yeah. And so um, when I was like 12 and 13 years old, I infamously would take my, um, my, 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 uh, allowance every week and and get on the train and go down to get on the l train and go downtown and round up about six or seven homeless people and take my allowance and go feed them and i did that from the time i was like maybe like 11 until i was about 14 or 15 years old and my parents just accepted that this is who i was and that's what i was gonna do and you know most parents would be like you you know your, your baby down there with the homeless and they, they were just like my baby's just you know this is she's gonna do it regardless this is what she does um and so you know so parts of me has always been concerned about the well-being of my community but Mm -hmm. I've I've been journaling since I was like seven I remember my grandmother buying me a little um there's a short story on my Amazon page that I wrote that's a, a magical version of me reflecting on my grandmother taking me to this little um, country store and uh, my grandmother had a farm in rural Illinois and then buy me journals because as young as seven or eight I started journaling so I, I feel like it all happened and I've been on this path as both an yeah. activist and a writer for for always 
you just came out of the room just talking and doing <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I know your parents were like, what are we going to do with her? Yeah, they were like, something. this one is a handful. This one is a sure enough handful. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I can only imagine you. I bet you were so fiery. Just, yeah, I was just <laughs> So with your writing that you're doing, and I know that you've been a director and you've been involved in television, is any of your writing, will it be on the screen anytime soon? Or do you have aspirations to go into movies? Yeah, so um, the there is going to be a film version of I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. Those film rights have been bought, purchased. Um, yes, so that's going to be a movie. I'm super excited about it. Um, I wish I could give y'all more details, but they're not letting me release any details. Um, but Autumn Bailey, who, the book, y'all. Yeah, the book. Book, you read the book ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, so that film is getting made into a, um, that um, that book is getting made into a film. And I have a couple other projects that I'm pitching around right now, trying to get made. But I, you know, I, I worked in film for a long time, what we call below the line jobs. So on like a budget sheet, mm-hmm. on a on a film budget, there's above the line, which is going to be your writers, directors, producers, and lead actors and studio executives. Those people are all considered above the line. And then everybody else who works on a movie is considered below the line. Um, So I worked below the line for a very long time. I was Tyler Perry's production secretary. Um, I I worked as a development assistant on Being Bobby Brown, the Bobby and Whitney reality show. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I freelanced as a wardrobe assistant. And I lived in LA for four years. I freelanced as a wardrobe assistant and I got to work on like Charmed and Dharma and Greg and all that stuff back in the day as a day player. So you don't get credited when you're a day player, but I did get credited on all the Tyler Perry stuff and on Being Bobby Brown. And and I've also produced a couple independent films that are um, either on YouTube or um Amazon so I'm looking to do more things in that realm because that's what I went to school for like I actually studied um went to film when I went to college um I studied film with a concentration in producing and so I'm looking to do more writing and producing and tv and film so fingers crossed but the yeah. one thing that's coming for sure is that I'm not done with you tonight movie so well I cannot wait to see it for sure and I know all the audience they can't wait to see it too yeah. you've been using your voice for so long how important do you think right now it is to use our voices to amplify the voices and to not be silent I think it's more important than ever because I think for the first time ever people are actually listening um so you know we might as well take advantage of this moment and continue to lift our voices and we don't you know I want people to understand that like we all don't have to lift our voices in the same way I mean I choose to be out on the front lines and get tear gassed and shot with rubber bullets and <laughs> and pepper sprayed and all that jazz but that's not everybody's journey you know what I mean and yeah. for me I've come out of the street some and kind of started working behind the scenes on things that need to get done um, on a more organizational level but like this is the way to amplify the you know um you know the voice of the black constituent is having a having a you know having a a a show like this, um, having, a, you know, having a podcast like this and amplifying the voices of yeah. Black writers who are doing the work. Um, this this is your work, you know what I mean? So it's like, that's what I want people to recognize that like all of our work doesn't look the same. Like if, if police brutality, we can all, you know, have commentary on how difficult it is, but it's not all of our journey. Some of us need to focus, to focus on education. Some of us need to focus on healthcare. Some yeah. of us need to focus on economics. Some of us um, you know, need to focus on wealth, the wealth gap. Like some of us need to focus on, you know, um, the textbooks and, and curriculum and all these things. And so I just tell people, find what your passion is and what your gifting is. Um, maybe you like working, maybe you want to look out for, you know, retired black veterans, you know, and make sure they're getting their just due. Um, whatever that is and whatever that looks like, you may just have one person, you may have a mentee who comes from a space where they wouldn't get the attention you were giving them and you're going to nurture that child. That's doing your part. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't require you to make, you know, national news to do your part. If you mentor a kid who otherwise wouldn't have gotten the tools that you gave them, you've done your part. I love it. I love how you are thinking it's more of a collective. It is. I know collective. people may see you speak or they may have heard of all the things that you've done and they may feel like I can't do that. That's not for me. But right. everyone can have a voice they can have a purpose a reason or a way to get involved so I love that thought of find your niche find what your lane is yeah 
that makes sense. I like that. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be over. I mean, you could wake up tomorrow and decide I've been hoarding clothes for three months and then go to Goodwill. You don't know whose life you're making a hard hitting decision for. I remember when I was a struggling young mom um, and there were times where the Goodwill was the only place I could afford to buy his clothes. I'm grateful for whoever dropped that stuff off. Mm -hmm. So how much has your life changed since that video came out? Whew, a lot. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's changed a lot um well just because I think the book is getting more attention um mm-hmm. you know the book had a certain level of success prior to that we have been nominated for an NAACP image award prior to that but we didn't make the New York Times until after that um amazing number one yeah. y'all number one <laughs> yeah so we didn't you know so it, it changed a lot of things like that for me personally I've been speaking um, but it definitely changed the amount of offers that I get, the spaces in which I get those offers, and like just introduced me to some people in the world who may not otherwise have known um, that I existed or my work existed. So it's 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 been a good, it's been a good thing. Mm. So you're going to use this platform to go further and kind of move into the film and industry and kind of make it bigger and better, right? Yes, definitely. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's definitely like, a, I think an opportunity for me to strike to continue. Cause you know, at the end of the day, the work that I do, whether it's the work that I do, you know, creatively as a filmmaker and a writer, or if it's work that I do on the front line, like I, I learned a very long time ago to take ego out of it mm-hmm. and to focus my energy on how I can help the collective. So when I'm thinking about things that I'm working on now, I, I try very hard not to think of them in a selfish way. I try very hard to think of them about how can this push the needle? It may be pushing the needle for the entire community. It may be pushing the needle for the diaspora. It may be pushing the needle for my for niece or nephew that I'm able to give a job, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, I try to think about things in terms of how I can have an effect on the collective, even like one of the projects that I'm working on Again, with my partner that I mentioned earlier, um, T Dog the Dawn, is we're working on putting together an independent streaming network. Well, that creates, you know, that creates employment in multiple facets for people who are looking for an opportunity. So beyond those who are looking for a creative space, then that creates where we can build black executives at our company. You know, mm-hmm. we can we can take young, a young, you know, black legal mind and eventually give them the opportunity to be over our legal department. And so I think that that's one of the things that we have to start doing as a, as a community is thinking about things in terms of ownership but not from a selfish space of like, I'm about to blow up, but from a collective space of like, okay, I I may be about to blow up from this, but also I just employed 300 black people and I just employed them in our community. So I just raised the tax value of our community. So now I'm in the community and now I can see that the, you know, that the community needs a cleanup, that we need to take down some civil rights, you know, um, um, that we need to take down some, um, you know, uh confederate monuments and put up some murals to malcolm x you know or whatever that is going to look like i think that when we as a collective care about how we're moving and how the fabric of that affects all of us i think we'll be in a better place and so that's where i try to come from now i I try to come from a place a place of like is whatever i'm doing is it helping more than me yeah because if it's just helping me then that's not good enough i love that thought of generational changes because yeah. it affects more than just your immediate family and those that you care about. If everybody thought like that, you know, the world would be perfect for sure. But a change maker like yourself and the work that you're doing definitely makes an impact for sure. So I thank you for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. I know we're running short on time and I want to give you time to back for the rest of your evening for sure. Is there anything you want to leave with our audience? Is there anything you're dying to tell them about the future of where you're going to be, uh, what to look for? I know we had a movie coming out. So y'all look for that movie, get the book. And I'm going to plug it again, get the book for (laughs) sure. But anything else you want to leave with our viewers? Yeah, the the one thing that uh, is twofold. The one thing that I would just want to leave with them is to make sure that you are living a fully balanced life. Like the most revolutionary thing that you could do right now is self-care, self-education, and self-motivation. 
Um, because if you have that, there's no way you can't penetrate the world in a positive way um, if you've done the work that you need to do personally first. And I'll let that lead into the next thing that I have coming up here in Atlanta uh, this coming Sunday. Um, September 20th is the first one, but I'm going to be doing it every third Sunday of the month. Um, it's with my dear friend, uh, another activist, um, Queen Yanajaha. Um, it's Queen Yanajaha and Friends Presents. I'm one of the friends. Um, it's also my good sister, Shar Bates, who used to host a show called Cop Watch on BT, And then the good brother, um, Christopher Brown, not the singer, but the activist, okay. <laughs> Christopher Brown. <laughs> Um, and we are doing, um, we're doing an event every third Sunday of the month called Revolutionary Healing. Um, and it is basically like a day retreat for Black people so we can address ah. our ancestral trauma. And so we, um, we have hmm. workshops, like, so there's going to be, like, the first one is this Sunday, we're going to have meditation and yoga, and we have some Native American brothers coming down to do a water walk with us um, on the river, ah. that right by the river. Um, and then we're having special guests. Um, every month we have one to two griots. Griots are elders um, who are significant in the community who will come and give a lecture and basically to share their story as a form of education. Um, and so lots of like, you know, yeah, and it's family it's friendly that you can bring the entire family to the event. But I think that's one of the things that we have to start doing as a community is healing from yeah. all of the trauma and all of the PSD and the pain that we suffer every day. And so that's one of the things that we're doing is revolutionary healing every third Sunday in the month starting here in Atlanta and eventually we want to branch out to other cities but that was my next question when yes. is it coming some somebody <laughs> close to the Texas yes yes we definitely plan on uh, our goal for next year if the world has opened back up yeah um, is to, to tour it to pick about 12 cities and then tour um, revolutionary healing because it's important um and our mental health and our spiritual health is something um that we've separated from that we definitely need yeah, self-care is radical. I love it. Self-care is so radical. But for me, for all things Kim Jones, you can find all things Kim Jones events coming up, where to find me on social media, all that kind of stuff on my um on my website, which is kimjoneswrites.com. So that's www.kimjoneswrites.com. And right. everything is there. My merch, my books, my events, videos, all that stuff. All of it. Great. Yeah, it's all there on the website. So now you all have it. You have the book. Copy. it. Follow her. Keep in touch with her. Yes. I promise you, she is going to be doing some amazing things. I, even outside of what she's already doing. She's going to be doing some amazing things. This year. <laughs> and if the world opens back up anytime soon, watch out. Yeah. It's coming. <laughs> coming. It's coming. Yes, it's coming. Oh, thank you. Thank you again so much. For joining us uh if you have anything in the future feel free to come back on our show we would love to have you talk about your next things coming up right invite in. your friends tell <laughs> them to and, and all you guys who are watching if you're not following book mecca book mecca of texas on facebook book.mecca on instagram you can always watch these interviews later you can share them you can tag and follow us let more people know because we want to see the voices behind the stories. The stories have life behind yeah. them and we want to know more. So thank you again so much. And you have a wonderful, wonderful day, Kim. Thank you. And I'm so proud of you and the work that you're doing, sis. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. We got to <laughs> connect these kids. Yes, <laughs> sure. For sure, for sure. That is definite. You All have right. a good one. You take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>